and rather than you know something else. So um, that zoning and permitting is is probably the second one. And for us, the third is power, um, because when you bring if if it's a standalone pole, most power companies these days are treating any pole you put up as a standalone pole. That pole is going to have to have an address. It's going to have to have a meter. It's going to have to go on to their grid and be monitored and managed. And you know that's not necessarily how DAS gets deployed, right? You're going to want to put up maybe 50 small poles and have one master meter that then you know they basically say, okay, the master meter says this. We're going to divide that by 50, and that's what each one of the poles costs. So that's a it's really a, a re-education process of the power company, or at least letting them start to work with us a little bit um, on, uh, on how power gets deployed to the poles themselves. Uh, Mike, from the logistics sure. side? Yeah. So if you think about it, I mean, everyone's heard the horror stories about companies that have bought stuff to plan and have all the material on hand, still can't complete the job. Um, on a regular basis, I get calls in my office, people trying to sell, back, sell stuff back to me. They bought it two years ago and they knew they needed it for a project and now they're figuring out they've got a huge problem with inventory. Um, something you don't think about on the front end of a project is, is the cost of the inventory and, and what ultimately happens with it when you don't use it. So by waiting till the last second to buy your stuff, you, know, you, you run the risk of going to a manufacturer that you plan to use their stuff and they don't have it. So having a partner that's storing that inventory on their shelves and having it available, um, it, it gives you flexibility. You know, it, it gives you financial flexibility to, to wait. Um, and you know, ultimately, you know, you're looking at you're looking at materials being part of your cost on the on the front end. It, it, it's not something that people typically do. They usually wait and then they buy it. So just it, it gives you flexibility. Yeah. Uh, just raise your hand if uh, anyone uh, has a question from the audience. Uh, obviously, uh, we want to hear from you as well. And. Uh, um, I, I want to raise something about uh, the, uh, the new spectrum coming uh, in the incentive auctions in, in the spring. Obviously, it won't be available for quite a while. 5G is, is uh, on the horizon. You know, I'm a, I took Latin instead of physics in high school, no kidding. Uh, but so, <laughs> as I understand, uh, you know, 5G, it's going to be higher frequency, it's got to be lower, down closer to the end user. What are the implications uh, for, for DAS and small cells of, uh, of these new spectrum uh, opportunities? Uh, I'll start with uh, uh, Fakri. Sure. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing that we're talking about 5G already. I, I know you guys all heard that or, you know, several <laughs> times now, right? Um, and I think what's interesting about it is I don't know if anybody attended the Mobile World Congress earlier this year. 5G was the name of the game. And what I've come to conclude uh, from that is, is that it's more of a marketing um, really gimmick than it is really technical. Uh, the standards are not even there yet. Uh, interestingly enough, if you look at even LTE deployment, whether here in the United States, which is you know where we are way ahead of the rest of the world, there are countries where they have not even deployed, they're not even fully 3G deployed yet. So as, as these, you know, as, 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 you know, whether it's a new spectrum or, these, uh, or, or, or a new technology that we are introducing, in fact, that bring, brings up the question again, what are, what, how do you define a small cell? What, what's a small cell? And what's the challenge? What are some of the biggest challenges? From a technical perspective, I can tell you that one of the biggest challenges is supporting multi-band, multi-carrier. Considering that American Tower is a mutual host provider, that's at the heart of how we, we, we do that. That's how we maximize our investment. So when we're talking about, you know, whether a new auction or we're talking about new technology, that's going to be the impact. How compatible are these systems that we are building today and these, and these solutions that we have today with these, with these new systems? And truly, if you look at that, you'll find DAS is a, probably the most compatible, at least with the 600 spectrum, for example. WCS or, or, or even to an extent uh, the, the 2.5 TDLTE. Um, so again, it's that compatibility, that's the impact that we will have on, on, on infrastructure. Uh, 5G, I think it's probably premature at this point to be talking about the impact of, mm -hmm. e before we even decide on what we're gonna do about 5G and with respect to small cells or DAS, how are we gonna integrate LTEU or LLA, uh, I mean LA, um, how are we going to integrate Wi-Fi with, with the products that we have today? I, I think these are more pressing matters mm -hmm. where our customers, whether it be it the, 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 the carriers or the property owners, would appreciate 
you know, more that, uh, rather than, you know, focusing on something that is really not ready yet, premature to be talking about. Uh, I'll, I'll toss that up as a jump off for anyone on the panel wants to hit it, uh, uh, spectrum issues. Yeah. But Just think to kind of piggyback on Fakhri's uh, commentary, I, I think we are kind of approaching the, that 5G realm when it comes to our overall set of tools and solutions in what's basically considered like a toolkit. But DAS, I think, today, considered, considering what it was years ago, has really become more flexible, more dynamic, able to support the new frequency bands themselves. I think gradually we're proving that to the industry, I mean, to the point uh, WCS is actually currently supported in our particular platform, but it's not even being utilized by AT&T just yet, at least officially speaking. I mean, so again, we have to wait for the standards to actually kind of get squared away. But in terms of, again, gradually approaching the 5G realm of supporting for the carriers, 2.5 is actually being deployed by Sprint these days. And so we have to work closely with them to see where they want 2.5 deployed in a DAS solution where they may not actually just yet because it might not be ready on the actual macro at that point in time. But thankfully, yeah, we have actually been able to get DAS solutions out there for Sun Life Stadium or even Kauffman Stadium out there nationwide. Multi-sector networks, as a matter of fact, are being extended for 2.5 for Sprint these days. So I think that's just the overall resonance of going toward that 5G generation and later on eventually with 600 megahertz for those appropriate carriers. Great. Um, I'm going to go back to the, uh, the tweets. Uh, Dear HetNet experts, are all small cells born equal? Well, I don't know if uh, Thomas Jefferson, when he wrote the Declaration of Independence, was uh, thinking about small cells, but it's an interesting question. I'll throw this to Art. You may have a perfect uh, answer for this. Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, that, that, that's why our company is having a lot of success in the business, because self-optimizing networks, you know, kind of plug and play installation, system commissions in about an hour. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the stuff that, that that you're referring to around neighbor lists and everything else and PCI allocations, it all has to be automatic. And you know, th that was one of the things that, that we had to partner with with Verizon was PCI allocation strategies because they're one of the first companies to go to market with two different bands of LTE. And so we had a lot of conversations with their engineering folks around how do you want to do it, what do you want to see in the code. And you know, how, how do you want to you know how do you want us to learn about your macro network? And um, the early generations of small cells, the, the, they didn't support uh, you know soft handover, which is kind of irrelevant now with LTE because LTE is hard handover. But there's so many things that they didn't have a self awareness around the rest of the uh, the macro cell ecosystem that they got a bad name. And you know. I, I was a person that did, my prior role as an enterprise network manager, I wanted cellular service. You know, I had, uh, what, 19,000 iOS devices on two towers. But my buildings were in the desk zone. They were like 125,000 square feet. So there was no way that any service could, could be gotten indoors in the DAS, DAS world because we didn't have any fiber underground between buildings. So we had 40 buildings, angry people, but no way to solve it. So we were, we were looking at you know, small cells as a way to solve the problem. And that's one of the reasons I left enterprise IT and came to the small cell world, because I actually wanted to buy it as a customer. And I, 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 I walked SpiderCloud into a carrier in 2010 saying, please, if, if, you, if you allow us to connect us to the network, we'll buy it. And I was just a, a newbie that absolutely didn't understand that it takes years of work and pain and suffering to be allowed to connect to an operator's network. But it, things are definitely not born equal. OK. Uh, anyone else on uh, small cells? If uh, I could piggyback sure, sure. Art, right? Yes. To piggyback on Art's point, um, to kind of put it in layman's terms, at least in my own particular opinion, it's, it's really a balancing act, I think, especially at this point in time, um, in trying to get the small cell itself to properly be integrated with the current infrastructure and not interfere necessarily too much with the existing macro that's there, keeping in mind eventually, too, in the near term, the macro, or at least long term, I guess you could say, the macro is supposed to be continuing to optimize, be optimized, I should say, by the respective carriers. So all these little things you have to take into account, again, it's basically a balancing act. It really is. The heartbreaking part for me is when I hear about a small cell that gets deployed, and again, because all these different, these, all these small cell vendors are trying to do the same concept, but better than everybody else and quicker than everybody else, you hear about one getting deployed and not necessarily penetrating as far as what you initially planned it to. So what are you going to do for those other one or two users that, set, that tend to walk outside the actual coverage area and then before they hand off onto the macro? 
uh, it can anybody, be a challenge. Anybody, audience, uh, questions? Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll stay with... Mike and I are the yep. dumb ones down here, right? We, yeah. All small cells look the same to us. <laughs> <laughs> right. At, at, at the same right. time, right. everybody's definition of the small cell is different. Right. So right. people come right. looking for small cells with us and, right. you know, what do you mean? I don't know. I just know I need small cell. Right. For us, it's they still need power, they still need co-locatable space, and they still need backhaul. Right. right. Those are, you know, right. So for us, they look the same. You've got to pick, pack, and ship them, mm -hmm. and you do the same. <laughs> and, and, pa and Patrick Comscope uh, is getting bought uh, Irvana, which is a small cell company. So, uh, are there you know small cells somewhat uh, different, uh, unequal, or superior, or something uh, from other uh, small cells? Well, or? I would agree with Art. Definitely, is, uh, not all small cells born equal. And I, and I think it's going back to the Irvana acquisition. And I, I think for most of you who may already know, and I recently acquired a small cell company, uh, Irvana. People, they often ask, how does it really fit in Comscope's strategy? And I, if you look at before, the group, we're in the business for enhancing coverage and capacity. So that doesn't necessarily limit it to DAS. If you look at the DAS industry in general, it's really evolving towards enterprise. And if you believe that, and small cell is a part of it, and uh, Aravana is a leading small cell OEM to the plug. Uh, we've been around in the, in the market for over 10 years and deployed um, over a million, a lot of the small cell uh, 3G and small cell through the network. And I think we believe that differentiate itself uh, is through the, the product architecture and innovation. The addition of air monitors is equipment and I think it really enables Comscope to address the overall head net, the ecosystems in the broader range. And you're talking about people from single operator, single technology, low capacity on one end and all the way to the other end it will be multi-operator, multi-technologies and high capacity as a neutral host, nice sort of venues on the other end. And I think it together, if you look at the industry in general, it's evolving and helps really the operators in its real evolution and towards the out ramp. Okay, uh, back to the tweets. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded when it a few years ago, uh, Conan O'Brien uh, said, uh, did, you, did you hear that uh, YouTube, uh, uh, Twitter, and Facebook are merging, and it's going to be called You Twit Face? So, um, uh, any, anyone else? So, uh, how will HetNet developments influence network security? And, uh, you know, I, we were talking about, you know, enterprises moving away maybe from BYOD, bring your own device, because of security issues. Um, but what are the implications uh, for DAS uh, on these issues, uh, network security issues? Um, jump all, whoever wants to, to, to take it. I think it's a good question to ask. Um, I, I think that when it comes to the typical enterprise customers that are out there, whether they have a public safety DAS being installed or even a multi-carrier solution, that's oftentimes a question that's asked way too late. Uh, not necessarily too late to help it technically speaking, but definitely late in the game considering when they should have been asking the question sooner and allowing us to work with their IT team or the integrator for that matter to work with the IT folks, get the appropriate network resources allocated and make it work, make it one with the actual IT staff that's on hand that will eventually likely have to interface to it and work with it to maintain it in the future. So there's always different business cases, but it's definitely a topic that needs to get further explored and further brought to the surface for different enterprise customers, I'm sure, for just about any particular venue. Yeah, Art, you were talking about the vertical piece of it? Uh, yeah, so, so because we ride on the Ethernet backbone, um, in about 75% of our installations in Europe, the customer has provided the transport network vertically in the building. So the incumbent power over Ethernet, Ethernet switched infrastructure is configured by the customer, and they tend to carve off the VLAN uh, so that it's a private network, so it's not running in band with the rest of their, their, their production data traffic. And in certain conversations where a security officer says, our policy says nothing will be on our network that we don't control, um, the operator has tended to just build a separate Ethernet network in the building to you know, transport it because, because of the policy. So we're in this evolving situation where you know, to see 75% of the customers donating network capacity to the operator, it means that the problem is just as critical for them to solve as it is for the operator to solve. So. Okay, any uh, audience, uh, any questions? We'll go, uh, 
go back to the screen. Oh, what is the outlook for multi-operator small cells? Is the outlook different for multi-operator indoor versus outdoor? Interesting question. Um, and why don't we just start with Comsco uh, Comscope, uh, Pat, and work down. Well, like I said, if we believe the enterprise is really the future of DAS, and I think there is a convergence. Eventually, we're going to get there. It's between DAS and small cell. And I think if you look at DAS's equipment, the second generation, the newer generation of the DAS, from architecture and, and everything, the features and everything more becoming digital. There are several vendors in today's market and they actually uh, providing that feature since it's digital. And then, of course, while maintaining the DAS characteristics, which is multi-carrier and uh, providing technologies as a neutral host, that sort of environment, that's really the attractive for DAS. And that small cell, I think, is getting more if you look at the industry is a small cell, and I think the R will come on than that. It's, it's starting with single band and single technology. You see uh, some sort of dual band, and uh, eventually we'll get multi band because that's really just the convergence between the two. The game, and I think if you look at competing in the enterprise market, it really you had to be simple, had to be scalable, and flexible because we were talking about a piggyback, the, the, the panels we were talking about earlier. You're talking about 5G, talking about different spectrum. And how do you deal with from either DAS or small cell? Are you talking about if you add another spectrum or technology, add another box next to it? Or for, for DAS, are you going to be add another extension, separate box to it? Or are you going to come up with a new product? And I think that's the challenge if you see current systems. And every two years, there's new technologies, there's new frequency bands, there's new capacity requirements that keep on upgrading. And I think eventually, it's really, it, the, prevent the DAS really becoming really popular as big, if you will, into the enterprise is you have to address the cost issue and also the simplicity and how you add a 600, you add another uh, 5G somewhere. And I think it's digital, we believe digital is the way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, looking for a neutral host solution, we believe this is the biggest challenge, in fact, for small cells today. That's why DAS continues to be the dominant solution for, for inbuilding for in building needs. Um, it was interesting that it was, what, almost a year ago, uh, the, the statement was made that DAS is dead. We're still talking about DAS. When something dies, you usually <laughs> don't talk about it. Uh, but we are talking about it, and that's because what's, the alternatives today don't offer a neutral host solution. It is, it is at the heart of our business model at the American Tower. So, What's the outlook? I think I would look for OEMs and I would look at for equipment manufacturers to tell us what that, you know, what that outlook is. Uh, there was also a question, is the outlook different for multi-operator versus indoor versus outdoor? I believe it is the case. Um, there is much more flexibility with outdoor um, you know, solutions yeah. that you can achieve that probably faster than you can for, for in-building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah, definitely. I think the challenges are the indoors where the demand is much higher because the, the macro generally does cover the outdoors. Yeah, I, note, I note this uh, question comes from Martha Grass, so it's going to be in the pay, it's going to be in RCR. So uh, get your, you know, make sure you a great so, uh, Martha's a great source of information. I know for me at least. So well, it, as you may not know, that we we've, we've announced uh, multi-operator support, huh? both uh, shared spectrum. Um, Nobody does it in the U.S. Um, it's more like a TELUS and Bell Mobility in Canada share spectrum, and they connect to two, two different mobile cores. And we've announced, you know, shared equipment where like, it's called Moran uh, in the in the small cells world. So, you know, we're we're working towards it. It, but we ran into this incentive issue because small cells are being used by the operators to take subscribers from from other customers, other 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 operators. So the incentive of the operators is not to light the enemy spectrum. They want to make their spectrum awesome, and they don't care about anybody else. So, so you have a situation where uh, the operator will provide the equipment, and you, you'll, you'll see that the other, other guys are subscribers. So if, if the enterprise can't afford to do anything themselves because the building is too small, or the fixed costs, or you know, insert issue here, um, if the operator provides something, it's better than nothing. Yeah. So you, you run into this uh, very interesting issue indoors where you, you, you can decide to do nothing because it's not a level playing field. And I've seen that at universities where they're saying, we'll have bad service everywhere because legislatively we can't, we can't light just one operator. So you have no service. 
And then you have other people saying, okay, if, if, if Verizon or Vodafone or whoever will provide it for free, yeah. awesome, we'll do it. And then you see people pour it over. Yeah. Well, I know, yeah, I know, you know, from my experience, uh, landlords, they certainly, uh, you know, want to deal once with one provider, one operate, one neutral host provider. Uh, same thing with municipalities and the public rights of way. They don't want to have to do this again and again and again. Yeah. But, but what you see with site acquisition, uh, the site acquisition problem in small sales doesn't exist because the deal is between the operator and the enterprise. It's not between the operator and the facility. So the, that gate... You don't have to traverse that gate right. because you're not attempting to Good point. light a whole structure. Good point. Good point. Uh, questions? Anyone? I'm sorry. T yeah, Trace. Auto manufacturers are coming out with more and more cars that are mobile hotspots powering up several different devices. As those become more popular, what does that potentially do to the outdoor environment with regards to handoffs and interference, noise, and those sorts of things? Um, Anyone? Go, question, sorry. Yeah. Sure. What was that question? I, I didn't hear the whole. Uh, the auto. I, the Internet of Things, basically. Yeah, like basically. Yeah, where, where's? Yeah, they're, where, they're where, coming out with more and more cars that are mobile hotspots. So yeah. you've got, uh, you know, several yeah. or thousands of cars moving their signal down, powering devices willy-nilly. How right. does the outdoor environment right. deal with that? That's interesting. Yeah, right. offs interference, noise, and capacity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, putting and stuff right into the car now, right? Yeah, it's absolutely. Everything is connected. I mean, we're, we're changing the term to an extent I've heard a new one, you know, Internet of Things to Internet of Everything, right, where everything is connected. Uh, interference mitigation is going, to be, is going to be the key, and that's going to be built in these technologies. It would have to be part of, of the technology. That's what LTE Advanced, for example, offers. If you look at 5G and at least some of the prelim standards that are being built at the heart of that is going to be interference mitigation because of that, because of that situation. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's the frequencies we use. It's the different technologies we use. Um, and, and just making sure that the protocols and the standards that we are building will allow for them to play nice together at the end of the day. Yeah. Does that, it, 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 it does to an extent though. Today you, you, you're transmitting on different frequencies for these different applications. So it does. LTE where you're trying to unify all of that and on to 5G next, that is going to be one of the fundamental requirements for these technologies. I'm old enough to remember losing the AM signal in the Lincoln Tunnel, so it's a very different situation today. People Sounds to me like about. if anybody has a lot of right away under control, they have an infrastructure build opportunity, right? Um, yes, they do. Yeah, so I, I'll just kind of address that really quickly. Um, I don't know if folks know that um, Amtrak is working on bolstering the uh, onboard Wi Fi for the Northeast Corridor right now. So they want 100 megabits per train going on the Acela, right? And then when the two trains pass each other, you might get 50 megabits per train. But um, they are looking at you know, trying to uh, get that type of signal and that type of bandwidth down the Northeast Corridor where there are already a lot of users, right? Yeah. So uh, there is basically the same kind of problem that we're gonna create uh, with the, the Wi-Fi cars um, is basically some, somebody is going to have to provide the backhaul from the car to the internet and that's gonna happen from the corridor. So there needs to be additional bandwidth along the highway corridors, along the roadways um, than there is today. And there's gonna to have to be a, a, a lot of infrastructure deployed. That doesn't mean there has to be a 150 foot monopole every two miles, but um, they are